This is a video repeat of a talk I gave to the Oxford Urology Department's weekly review meeting, having completed the first 100 prostatectomies I've performed since returning from fellowship and commencing as a consultant at Oxford. Even having completed a fellowship and been deemed competent to perform radical surgery independently, it is of course important to record and report data for all cases. Furthermore, with techniques constantly evolving, it's really key to note whether adoption of any such techniques does deliver superior outcomes. We have a great team here in Oxford and I performed my first prostatectomy with them in April 2017. In this photograph to my left are Luis Barbera Martin, our specialist robotic anaesthetist, and Prue Barry, our robotic surgery practitioner who assists most of our cases. And various other members of the team. I work as one of five surgeons performing radical prostatectomies, both open and robotic, and between us we perform approximately 200 prostatectomies per year. To introduce this data, these 100 men were mostly from Oxford, although with six from Cambridge during the period where I was transitioning from Cambridge to Oxford at the completion of my training. The cases are between May 2017 and July 2018, with a couple of cases performed before that in March and April. The average age was 65 years, the youngest patient was 39, and the oldest 75. 22 of these 100 men were over 70 years old. Average BMI was just under 27, although I am happy to perform these operations on men up to a BMI of 33. We run a pooled operating list for prostatectomies in Oxford, where I work alongside Professor Freddie Hamdy, Simon Brewster, Richard Bell and Tom Leslie. And while we aim for the majority of cases to be performed by the surgeon who has seen the patient in clinic preoperatively, just under 20% of the men that I've operated on were seen by someone else preoperatively. To help with this I always phone my patients the evening before surgery and make sure that I go through with them a summary of the surgery the morning of the operation as if I'd seen them myself in clinic. The British Association of Urology Surgeons, BAUS, collate data annually from all surgeons performing radical prostatectomy, which allows all UK surgeons to benchmark themselves against other UK surgeons performing this operation. I'm represented by the red dot here, which shows that the data for the period in question puts me at 12th in the UK for number of operations performed. The baseline characteristics of these 100 men are shown here, with the vast majority, 83%, being intermediate risk disease and 16% were high risk disease. We have a policy not to operate on men with T3B disease outside of a clinical trial, of which we have a number ongoing at present, such as the PROMOTE study and the trombone study, although these data are not included in this number here. Here we have the intraoperative and perioperative characteristics. Mean estimated blood loss was 330 mils for these 100 men, with no transfusions required. Average consult time for my cases is 96 minutes, with on average an extra hour for those cases requiring lymph node dissection. Just those with high risk disease have lymph node dissections performed. 89% of these men went home on day one post-op. Post-operatively, 21 men had at least one post-operative complication, including a number of urinary tract infections, a number of which we have noticed were caused by Kermoxiclav resistant infections, in the light of which we have changed our induction antibiotic regimen with no further infections noted. Significant complications include five men readmitted after removal of their catheters for unexpected urinary leaks from their anastomoses, confirmed by cystogram. Each one of these settled on replacement of their catheter for a further two to four weeks. Other complications to note include a couple of men who developed acute urinary retention after removal of their catheter. In each case, this resolved after a short period of recatheterization and was interestingly followed by immediate continence. Two symptomatic lymphocytes developed from the 16 lymph node dissections performed, which were requiring of drainage, as is somewhat inevitable when extended lymph node dissections are performed. Of these complications, the five anastomotic leaks are higher than would be expected. I was a little concerned about these and inspected the timing of these leaks, noticing that most occurred within the first few months in 2017 after I started a concerted effort to maximise urethral length at the apex, an important determinant of early postoperative urinary continence. 
My hypothesis is that this may have led to over-thinning of the urethra on dissection in some men and consequent leak after construction of an initially watertight anastomosis. The trifecta of outcomes after radical prostatectomy includes margins, continence and erectile function. Here are the margin rates for these 100 cases. 18 of the 62 men with T3 disease, disease that was pushing outside of the prostatic capsule, had positive surgical margins. And 4 of the 34 men with T2 disease. The overall positive margin rate was 22%, which, as shown in the plot mentioned earlier, is lower than the 26% average in the UK. Another important aspect of cancer outcomes is the biochemical relapse rate. Nine of these men had PSA rises in the duration of follow-up at six months, although it should be noted that BCR can occur right out to five years and occasionally beyond. Again, looking at the spread of these positive surgical margins over my 100 cases, while fairly evenly distributed, there is certainly a cluster around the first quarter of cases, as I have been optimising my nerve sparing approach, with fewer positive margins during the later quartiles. As for continence, I have continence outcomes for most men at six weeks and just under half of men at six months. Working with a social continence definition of zero or one light pad, continence rates are 68%, 85% and 91% at six weeks, three months and six months respectively. And for erections, 42 men had good erections preoperatively and underwent either unilateral or bilateral nerve sparing. Few men recovered erections at six weeks, as it does take some time, of course, for bruising and swelling to settle. However, some 32% and 67 of men have recovered erections at three months and six months respectively. I've already mentioned a number of times the development of new techniques and approaches to this operation to optimise technical performance and outcomes. Indeed, we attend conferences several times a year to watch in 3D HD the technical skills of world leaders in the field. For example here, Dr. Vip Patel from Florida's Global Robotics Institute, who has performed the most radical prostatectomies on the robot of anyone in the world at 10,000 and counting. It is of course crucial to benchmark performance against other leading units in the UK and internationally. I undertook my fellowship training with Professors Declan Murphy and Tony Costello in Melbourne, Australia. This publication from 2009 presents the first 400 cases from their series performed at three leading urology units in Melbourne. These graphs represent the average operating time and continence rates split into 50 case groupings. You can see that my average consult time, shown here by the red bars, compares favourably alongside these data. Similarly, if the no pad and security pad data are combined here, then my rates for my first 100 cases at 3 months and 6 months are also comparable. The positive margin rates of 9.6% and 42.3% are comparable to my 11% and 29% for T2 and T3 disease respectively as are the continence rates of 91% and erectile function rates of 62% at 12 months. Closer to home, where I did my very initial training at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, which is the second largest robotic prostatectomy unit in the UK. Here are some interesting learning curves for console time and blood loss for their first 500 cases. My console times are much quicker than these curves, although it should be noted that these two surgeons were performing some of the first robotic prostatectomies ever performed in the UK, and so it was still early on in the learning curve for the field as a whole. My average estimated blood loss is very similar. A more recent update for the Cambridge unit at 1500 cases reveals a total T2 positive margin rate of 9% and T3 positive margin rate of 29% for T3A disease. Again, I have a bit of work to do on my T2 positive margin rates, although note that the first quartile of these cases were up at 11.9%, dropping to 9% and then 6% after this. My T3 margin rates are actually a couple of points better than all except the final quartile of this set of over a thousand cases. 
Finally, the largest radical prostatectomy center in the world, the Martini Clinic in Hamburg, who perform 2,500 robotic and open cases every year, report continence outcomes using the same definition of 70 to 85 percent at 12 months, depending on different techniques, against which my continence rates of 91 percent at six months are encouraging. In summary, these 100 cases were performed in just over a year up to July 2018. Average console time for non-lymph node cases was 96 minutes and estimated blood loss averaged at 330 mils with no transfusions required. Continence, defined as zero or one security pad, was 68%, 85% and 91% at six weeks, three months and six months respectively. Erections for those with good erectile function preoperatively and who had nerve sparing were 13%, 32% and 67% at six weeks, three months and six months respectively. My positive margin rates were 9% for T2 and 29% for T3, giving an overall positive margin rate of 22%. And finally, 5% of these men developed an anastomotic leak, all of which settled with prolonged catheterization, although I am working hard on eliminating this. Two men had strictures and two hernias needing surgical repair. Going forwards, I commit to recording and presenting my outcome data in the spirit of transparency and accountability to my patients and colleagues, and to both of whom I am immensely grateful for such support, trust and wisdom. Thank you for watching this video.